workplace safety and respect will come to order. Representative Fenton, you were here to, oh, no, wait, you were not here last week. Representative Portman, did, could you review the minutes quickly? No, ma'am, I did not review the minutes. All right. Representative O'Driscoll or Hortman, if you could review the minutes quickly. Representative Hortman. <laughs> Madam Chair, I would suggest that you have your vice chair re review them. We can approve them at the end of the meeting. Uh, if oh, they're right. Well, she wasn't here. But. Okay, maybe at the end of the meeting we could have time to make sure they're right. I'll forget. Not a fast reader, Madam Chair, sorry. Madam Chair, I will move the minutes from March 20th. Representative O'Driscoll reviews the minutes from and moves the minutes from March 20th. Any comments, questions, changes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Minutes are approved. Thank you, Representative Schultz. All right, today we're going to be hearing from a number of experts, several. We should be here for a, a while. Um, we're going to also hear from the Department of Management and Budget on their sexual harassment prevention policy and procedures report. We're going to start with our experts. We'll have Stephen Smith from Nichols Caster testify first, if he's ready. And, and for all the, the testifiers, if you could just uh, say your name and who you're with for the tape, I'd greatly appreciate that. Good morning. Uh, my name morning. is Steve Smith. I'm a partner in Nichols Caster in Minneapolis, where I represent employees exclusively in employment claims. Please be in. Thank you. So I've been asked to talk about best practices, and I'd like to break that down into a few different areas. First of all, in terms of uh, sexual harassment or anti-discrimination policies, procedures, and training, um, the investigation process itself in terms of the application of that policy, and also then lastly on mandatory reporting and some thoughts on that. So first of all, on harassment policies themselves and what's a, what a good policy looks like, I had a summary judgment in front of Judge Ann Montgomery in federal court once where she was chastising a defendant for having a policy. Everyone's got a policy. Her point was essentially everyone's got a piece of paper that says don't discriminate. Yeah, and uh, so the policy is just a piece of paper if it doesn't um, have any effect in action. And so the policies that I see that are the most effective, in other words, the employers that take action, um, create a culture where that culture leaves people with the understanding that they're going to take action when they come, when they come across uh, bad behavior, um, and they're going to take it seriously, and it's not just going to be theater. So the bigger question, I think, is how do you create that sort of culture uh, where it's understood that harassment isn't tolerated? And I think you do that in a couple different ways. First is training. Um, I think... Uh, and from, just so it's clear from my perspective, you know, representing victims, usually I'm looking, uh, we take, we're pretty picky, we take about four, five out of a hundred cases that come to us. And so I'm looking for bad behavior in the training, um, and bad behavior in terms of investigations that are theater. But the trainings that I see that are the most effective are usually done in person. Um, if you have a training uh, program where you just require your employees to move through a computer screen and click that they've watched it or click that to assert that they've watched a 20-minute video, that tends to be not particularly effective. I think the trainings also are better when they're in uh, small sizes, a small group size, um, where a trainer can move through vignettes fairly effectively and actually encourage people to talk about those things. And then there are some things that occur in the trainings themselves that um, tend to be uh, effective, and, uh, and that is calling people out who aren't taking the training seriously. Um, and we'll see that sometimes in the cases that we handle where someone made a complaint and then they had a training and they brought someone in and then the five people that were accused of harassment sat in the back of the room and chuckled the whole time and didn't take any of it seriously. And then uh, that also marginalizes the victims as well. But if you come in and you address it directly and the victims understand that they're going to be heard and you've got a plan <coughs> of action, um, those are the steps that go towards that culture. Um, I think that, and again, this uh, may be stating the obvious, having a, a trainer who's had experience in training before, sometimes what happens in what I view as potentially ineffective training 
is a trainer who uh, is sort of the usual suspects. I know a lawyer, that lawyer can probably do the training. Doesn't mean that uh, they couldn't be good at it the first time they do it, but the stakes are pretty high um, in this particular sort of me too moment that we're in. And so go get a train. We, we're in, we're blessed with a really great defense bar, I think. Uh, and they know how to do the training and that they've done it before. They know how to deal with difficult people. They know how to get uh, good conversation going in the relatively small group setting. So go get a trainer that's got some experience. I also think in terms of training that the best training in terms of the way it's received by the employees isn't necessarily training that is tied to an event that was just a fire in your workplace recently. So for example, something terrible happened and you're around and oh, you know, well, there was a harassment allegation, so now we need to have training. The best organizations that create that culture have training that isn't always based on something that happened in their workplace, in their work environment. So for example, um, with the sort of Matt Lauer MVC debacle um, within this last year, I know there are some Minnesota companies who brought in trainers to, and brought in their attorneys to, to say, because of this national event, we want you to know that we wouldn't tolerate this here, and we don't tolerate this here. We take this all very seriously. And it was received very well by the employees because it wasn't tied to a particular event that happened at that particular workplace. And so I think that was a good example of a really good practice to have the training be sometimes occasionally tied to an event that's something other than a fire in your workplace. In terms of the investigation process itself, um, you want a process that's designed to get to the truth. It's not necessarily theater. And so the, the, the cases that we see um, that uh, we're involved in that, that get in, uh, into the litigation stage oftentimes have a component of theater to them. And what I mean by that is there was a complaint, um, there was an investigation, the investigation um, somehow became an investigation of the person who complained of harassment, um, and then they came back and concluded nothing could be done and then everyone was just supposed to get along. Whereas I think the, the very good investigations um, have their objective of, well, let's try to figure out what happened here. And then once we know what the facts are or a best um, approximation of what the facts are, then we are in a better position to take action. And that results, um, that approach is the most effective from a culture standpoint. It also results in some uncomfortable moments because you're dealing with, uh, you know, possible termination um, and dealing with uh, usually powerful people. Um, for investigation process, best practices, I think um, that with a high-level harasser, I would usually recommend, and high-level meaning depends on your organization, someone with the power to certainly hire and fire, um, someone who, um, if you had their blessing, you, you would help you move through the organization. If you didn't, it would probably impede that. I usually think it's a good practice to hire an outside investigator. I know there are costs associated with that. And so I don't sit here and say that um, to try to minimize the costs associated with an outside investigator. But I think an outside investigator um, who, again, I think is perhaps uh, an employment defense lawyer in town um, who does investigations, who maybe isn't the person who's going to defend the claim, because if you've got an outside investigator that then you're going to use to defend the case, they're probably defending their own advice as well as defending the, the potential claim. So I, uh, there are lots and lots of good um, people in town that can be outside investigators. I think one investigation process mistake that we see is um, the investigator not talking to the witnesses identified by the victim. And so what I'm usually looking for is um, someone complains about sexual harassment or maybe they, there's, say there's an incident that occurs in January and uh, that person tells immediately four people. They tell their best friend and their mom and their spouse and uh, one other person maybe their dad, but they say, don't tell anybody. Um, and then four months later, then they make a formal complaint. And sometimes the organization will try to minimize the complaint. Why didn't you come up with this earlier? You're just making this up. This was fabricated. Well, the investigators typically will skip talking to those witnesses. Maybe you say, well, it's a family member. Um, but those witnesses, maybe the coworker witness, for example, um, usually are very good sources of information because they were telling that person something that they believed happened at the time or that happened at the time. It's really unlikely that they're lying about that to set up some sort of conspiracy or some claim later on. So the, the, most of the time, the failed investigations, they're not talking to the witnesses identified by the uh, particular victim. Um, in terms of best practices, I hear 
uh, maybe less so now, but it used to be sort of a big uh, comment in the defense bar. Well, what about the what about the alleged harasser? What we don't want to rush to terminate, and there's going to be a potential claim if we terminate the harasser. I just don't see that. I don't know if it's not a fiction. It's pretty close. I think the idea that you're going to be experiencing the sort of rush of claims from people that have been accused of harassment. We just don't see that. Um, you know, maybe some of the defense lawyers who work on the other side would have a slightly better perspective on that. Um, lastly, in terms of mandatory reporting, I think that's essentially what exists in the corporate world and with private employers right now, at least, at least practically in the sense that if a supervisory level employee is no, knows about harassment that's unwelcome in the workplace. I'm certainly going to come in and argue that their policies require that person to have brought it up the chain until it was addressed. And so to the extent that there are people with the power to hire and fire, people with management authority, um, who know about unwelcome workplace harassment and aren't reporting and aren't doing anything, um, at least in the private employer setting, I would argue under the Human Rights Act, that there's liability attaches at the point when a management level person knows of harassment and isn't doing anything about it. And so that may be a slightly different issue of than, than what um, you're seeking information on in terms of if you're saying mandatory reporting that, um, that all employees at all levels should report. Um, but I guess I'm talking about more um, employees who their knowledge could be imputed to the organization. So those are the pre prepared comments I have. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Senator Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. So is it best practice for trainings to have someone from who has experience on the defense side and on the prosecution side? And are we um, maybe not conducting optimal trainings if we only have a, a defense attorney and not a prosecuting attorney? Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. To the extent that I think there's sort of a built like for example, I've been asked to do trainings, but I don't do it because of the potential conflict. And I think so you may have a harder time finding um, employee side people that are willing to do it. Now maybe you could find someone who does both. So for example, I know Sheila Engelmeyer represents some plaintiffs and I know she represents primarily defendants, but she does both. But for example, like I don't do any trainings because I don't, um, it could, you know, I might get a call later on from the training I did and I'm a witness in the training and also there were we just represent employees exclusively, so there may be some issues there with conflicts that um, I know there are for us. Um, I, I think it would be a great idea to get both sides in, although I will, I'll say that um, it, a lot of it just depends on the trainer. Um, so Jenny Gassman Pines, a partner at Green Espel, um, you know, she represents employers, um, but she's, she's an excellent speaker, and she's going to give a fair presentation. So, I mean, I, there are lots of people like that in the community. I think, uh, I think it depends on the, it sort of depends on the source. And, and, and this is a, maybe a little nuanced um, bit of advice, but you know, people's reputations are sort of known in the community. And I think uh, if you find someone who's generally viewed as uh, you know, sort of fair, it will matter less um, and has a good presentation to help. It'll probably matter less what side of the, what side of the fence they work on. But I'd say it'd be, if you can get um, a joint presentation from both sides, that would certainly be the best. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, sir, you had, um, uh, in your comments earlier, talked about um, an incident that might have occurred. It's not immediately reported, but then consulting with coworkers or others within the organization. And then at some point in the future, it's brought forward and it's attempted to be minimized at that point. Question for you. Um, can you talk about what obligation those individuals who learned about that information would be required to share with, uh, with, with that process to, to um, encourage reporting. Um, they, they have an obligation to report, they have an obligation to take activity and how that might work out with various different levels within the organization. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly to the extent that it's, a, I would take the position of a managerial employee that knows of unwelcome harassment in any organization in the state, I would certainly take the position that they have an obligation to go forward under the Human Rights Act to, to bring that to whoever the HR organization is, or take that up the chain until there's some um, action taken. Now, that these, uh, the, the sort of elephant in the room in my comments and your question also is, well, what do you do in a situation where the victim, the alleged victim doesn't want to come, doesn't want it brought forward? Um, I think to the extent that you are a higher level, 
that is, again, it's a managerial employee, someone that has the ability to hire and fire, I think they have an obligation to do that anyway. I think it gets more complicated in the sort of, for example, in the scenario that I, the fact pattern that I gave, where you've got, you know, if, you, if they're, you've got uh, whatever the lowest or next lowest level of employee in any organization, are you going to make them report it? I think that, um, you know, that's a little trickier. I don't know that that's, you can have a policy that does that, um, but then I, you know, are you going to punish people for not bringing it forward? I mean, it gets more complicated when you're talking about employees that are non-managerial, I think. Senator Bill Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one quick follow-up. So if someone learns of, of this and they're in the managerial role that you're suggesting and they don't report, or, or take action, what kind of consequences under law or do organizations have for those kinds of things? Mr. Well, Smith? Thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly we would take the position as the plaintiff's counsel in a, in a fact pattern like that that knowledge is imputed to the organization when, the, when someone at a managerial level knows of unwelcome harassment or any type of discrimination, really could be race, age, gender, disability, sexual orientation, and, the, and they don't take action and they let it continue. Because the, an organization, you know, the, the decision makers, the managers of any organization, those are the proxies for the organization at some point. Um, now, there are arguments um, in employment litigation, we fight you know, epic battles on, well, this person was a manager only in title, but they couldn't hire and fire. So, I mean, there are some nuances in between the lowest level manager that they are eliminated by the time you get to the CEO or the CFO. Thank you. It's Representative Portman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Smith, nice to see you. I wonder if you could comment on the standard of severe or pervasive and how um, folks in the workplace are faring in the court system when they're experiencing sexual harassment. We had some testimony earlier in this committee from Sheila Engelmeyer that the standard is so high now that a lot of things that we would all consider severe or pervasive aren't making it to the jury. Mr. Smith? Chair. Sure. Um, I think that assessment is accurate, and it's uh, it's uh, the, a couple things. First of all, the standard, whether it's mistakenly cited in by courts and defense counsel as severe and pervasive versus severe or pervasive, I don't know. But courts get it wrong. It is severe or pervasive. And of course, if you think about that, it makes a lot of sense. If you've got to um, say someone in the factory setting and they're being harassed by gross jokes and comments for a two-year period, and then they quit, and the company knew about it, and they quit. Well, that is, um, if, it's, if there's no touching, that doesn't mean it isn't severe just because it's gross comments, but, but it, it, it could still be hostile work, a hostile work environment based on that, um, the pervasiveness of it. And of course, the severity of it, and we've had cases where, you know, obviously one incident of criminal sexual touching, you know, of course, liability could attach right away if it's a high enough person in the organization. But, I think that I would agree with, uh, with Sheila Engelmeyer's assessment of it. And um, part of that is a product of um, us, uh, Minnesota, being in the A Circuit. Uh, and some of the A Circuit cases dealing with hostile work environment are terrifyingly wrong, in my opinion. The Duncan case is a good example. If you go take a look at the Duncan case, you will be, um, I would say, most people. Um, Privately, plaintiff or defense bar will look at that case and say, how does this, and it was a verdict for the plaintiffs that got taken away by the Eighth Circuit. You'll look at that case and you say, well, how is this possible um, that that wasn't um, upheld? So I think that is, uh, um, I think there are, there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of potentially redefining, I mean, not for this committee, perhaps, I don't know, but um, redefining what um, level of behavior would be considered severe or pervasive under the Minnesota Human Rights Act because and we'd like to think we're the, st the state's a leader in that area. And I think that uh, your observation is absolutely correct in the sense that the public perception and really also employers' policies talk about uh, how a very low level of you know, we don't, you know, essentially zero tolerance. Most, most employers will have policies that say we want to know about anything, even one joke or whatever, and so people are under the impression that they have protection when they bring that forward and oftentimes are very surprised. Certainly the people that call us that, you know, the 90% or plus that we don't represent, and sometimes for the reasons you've identified, are very um, surprised to learn that something that was a clear violation of their sex harassment policy isn't even close to being a claim that anybody could prevail on. Is there any other questions? 
All right, thank you so much, Mr. Smith. We'll move on to the next uh, testifier, Ellen Sampson, formerly with Stinson Leonard Street. Chair, members of the subcommittee, I'm Ellen Sampson. I retired last year from the firm of Stinson Leonard Street, where I specialized in both lobbying and employment law. Is that better? That's better. Okay. Um, as a law student, I actually had the privilege of working for the House of Representatives for two years. And after that, I spent two years um, working for the State Department of Employee Relations as assistant to the commissioner. So in a sense, this is like old home week, although this room is beautiful. <laughs> um, it's very impressive. During my career, I have represented plaintiffs and defendants. I've written policies, done investigations, and conducted many trainings, including years ago for the um, Minnesota State Senate. Um, today, I work as a, a, a mediator, uh, part-time. Um, and I have indeed mediated several sexual harassment disputes in the past five or six months. Words and definitions are important. They matter. It's important to know what you're talking about. And sexual harassment is different from a sexual assault, including, of course, horrible rape. Assault is a crime and should be treated as such. My remarks are directed toward addressing allegations of workplace harassment. Um, I would, um, this is generally not a criminal matter but a civil matter, unless it includes a battery or an assault or, or something horrible. I would define workplace sexual harassment in three ways. First, it's coworker inappropriate conduct, and that can be your joke, your comment, your request for a date or meeting, inappropriate um, touching, discussions of bodies or people's attire. It can be in person, in print, by text, by email, by phone. Um, it can include behavior both in and out of the workplace um, because if workers and coworkers are involved, the environment in which it occurs is less important than who's there. Not every offensive comment is harassment. I can talk about that later if there are questions. In this kind of harassment, the employer is generally, uh, the, I'm sorry, the alleged harasser is generally not in a position of power over the person that's being harassed. And an employer is generally liable for this kind of harassment. As I'm sure the people who testified previously about this would point out, it's the employer is only liable if the employer knew or should have known that the harassment was occurring and failed to take prompt and appropriate action. Second kind of harassment is the conduct by people in positions of power toward those over whom they have some type of power. This includes the manager or the supervisor who demands sex, inappropriately touches, sends texts, etc. The threat here is if you don't do as I'm asking you to do, you will suffer an adverse employment action. Um, this includes people who are not your direct manager or supervisor. In the political setting, if one legislator demands something from another legislator over whom that legislator may have the power to control a committee assignment, a bill hearing, that behavior fits in that category. Third is bad behavior directed toward non-employees, including lobbyists, members of the public, employees of other agencies. An example is the legislator who tells the lobbyist, if you don't do what I wish, I will not hear your bill. Um, so those are three separate kinds of behavior, and the employer needs um, to understand that that behavior is illegal under both state and federal law. The law doesn't require that the employer do anything particular. It requires that you take prompt and appropriate action, and that will depend on what happened. Um, therefore, there are several questions. The first, as Steve already pointed out, is an employer needs a policy. The policy should discuss assault and make sure the readers know that law enforcement is an appropriate avenue. It should tell you who's covered by the policy, including elected officials and non-employees. It should define harassment with examples. It should tell people what to do when they feel harassed or when they observe harassment. It should um, not require people to go to their supervisors first, because often it's the supervisor who's the harasser. You should provide at least two avenues in your policy for registering a complaint. 
should explain briefly what will happen when a complaint is received, to talk about investigations, protection from retaliation, and possible outcomes. A policy should never promise confidentiality because that's a promise you may not be able to keep. Training, Steve also touched on training. Um, um, training several kinds. First, there should be generalized training for everyone in the workplace that it's um, illegal to sexually harass, but it may, it's also a violation of house policy to sexually harass. You may have things in the policy that are more serious than the legal, and that goes to the question about pervasive. Um, you can prohibit things in your workplace that the law might not define as, as harassment. Um, employees need to understand what to do if they're a victim, if someone tells them about harassment, or if they observe it. Um, and I think Steve touched on that a little bit as well. Second, your managers and supervisors need separate training. They need to know what to do if they see something or hear something. They need to know they should report it. They shouldn't brush things under the rug. And this is classic. People say, oh, that's just Bob. Or you need to toughen up if you're going to work here. Not helpful. They should know that they need to report even if they think it's untrue, trivial, or involves their best friend. They need to understand, as Steve said, that if they don't report and they're a supervisor or a manager and they knew or should have known about this behavior, their knowledge can be imputed to you, their employer, and you could be liable for it. Third, and really important, you need to make sure that the people who receive complaints and investigators are trained. This is really complicated stuff, and you need to figure out who's doing what. The second thing you need to figure out is who's going to receive a complaint. People need to know, employees, managers, supervisors, outside people who come to the Capitol to work. Some employers identify HR. Um, in some, for some people, HR is considered part of management and not a safe place to bring a report on the theory that HR is busy covering up for management. Um, some people use a tip line. Some people use outside parties for receiving complaints. There's no one right way, but it's an important decision, and you should think about it. Your non-employees need to know where to bring a complaint and how to obtain the policy. The person receiving the complaint will have to be trained because they can't promise anything. They can't promise that the person's going to be fired, that this is going to happen or that's going to happen, because the receiver of the complaint, at that point, they simply don't know, because the next step is investigating complaints. And um, I concur with Steve that the higher ranking the accused, the more important it is to hire an outside investigator. The investigator needs to know or be trained on how to do an investigation, how to deal with retaliation issues, confidentiality issues, among many other things. The, um, the investigator is often, but doesn't need to be a lawyer. There are some people here in town who are non-lawyers who are terrific. There are other people who are lawyers, but who don't formally practice on either the plaintiff or defense side, but do only investigations. Again, there's no one right way, but it's an important decision. You should decide who will do it. You might have different investigators for different potential offenses. That's all fine. You need a system, and you should be consistent, and your investigators should be well trained. Next, what happens? The investigation's over. OK, fine. So now what? Um, you need to figure out whether the investigator will make an oral report or a written report. Um, who will the investigator report to? What supervisor, what manager will the investigator or report to the Speaker of the House, the majority leader, the minority leader, some combination thereof? Who's going to be in the position to listen to this report? Will the investigator make recommendations? I myself prefer an investigator not make recommendations because that is the job of the decision maker. What I want an investigator to do is I want them to tell me who they interviewed. I want them to tell me what, if any, documents they looked at, what they learned. I want them to assess the credibility of the people they talked to. And I want them to tell me what they think happened. And in order to do that, they're going to have to talk to the plaintiff's witnesses, the defendant's witnesses, and then make some kind of an assessment of what happened. I like my reports, and I've done them as an investigator in writing, 
I've also received them from investigators many times. I like something in writing because in case litigation ensues, it's useful to have a writing that you can show that you had an investigation and you have some result. Other people strongly disagree with me and they only like it orally. So again, you know, there's not right, a right answer. Okay, the investigation's done. What comes next? First, you need to decide if further action is appropriate. Sometimes it's not. And there's ways to, de to deal with that, to explain to the complaining party that you couldn't support the person's um, allegation and how you deal with that. Um, it's a tricky thing. You may decide that the complaint has merit and something has to happen, but it, if it's a public official who's an elected official, then you know there's certain things you can and can't do. I mean, um, if the person is is not actions up to and including termination may be um, appropriate, but it's not the only option. Deciding what to do depends on what the person did, how the person responded positions of the people involved, the law doesn't mandate a particular response. What the law mandates is prompt and appropriate action. So there's many steps to this process, and in preparing documents as you go forward, I would make sure I knew what's going on in each step. Um, that concludes my prepared remarks, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Representative Portman? Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Sampson. Could you speak to us a little bit about the difference between um, offensive behavior and sexual harassment? Ms. Sampson? Sure, <laughs> Madam Chair, Representative Burton. It's a really interesting question. Um, you know, in, 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 in my, my, my line of work, there are um, uh, uh, some people that have classically been referred to as equal opportunity harassers. They're just obnoxious to, to men, to obnoxious to women, to whatever the circumstance, and um, it's not uh, gender, um, or you can't identify it as being gender-based. Um, when it's se um, sexual harassment, there's some sort of gender component involved in it. Any other questions for members? Thank you, Ms. Sampson, I appreciate it. Next on the list is Tina Marisom from University of Minnesota Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action. Members, just for your perspective, we have uh, eight people today to talk. So this is the third person. Welcome to the committee, and if you could just state your name before you begin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Tina Marisam. I'm the director of the Office of Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action at the University of Minnesota. I'm also the Title IX coordinator. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to talk about the university's approach to preventing and responding to sexual harassment. Uh, we all know that sexual harassment can be terribly destructive to the individuals who experience it. Uh, we know this intuitively, but the research bears this out, that sexual harassment often causes great harm to the mental and the physical health of those who are subjected to it, not to mention the harm it does to our workplace and to our campus environments. So knowing this at the university, when we learn that an employee or a student may have experienced sexual misconduct, uh, the campus Title IX office reaches out to that impacted person to let them know where they can go to get confidential support and where they can go to initiate an investigation. We want every person who tells the university that they've experienced sexual misconduct to re receive a response that's compassionate and serious. Uh, we know that this first response is critical and can determine whether that person ultimately trusts our institution enough uh, to report what happened to them or to access resources for personal support. Uh, we also know that sexual harassment tends to fester in places with an organizational tolerance of harassment, in places that fail to take complaints seriously, that fail to sanction those who engage in sexually harassing behaviors, or that fail to protect complainants from retaliation. So it's critical to have a truly effective investigative and disciplinary process in place, uh, both for sexual harassment and for retaliation. Uh, at the university, we have uh, highly skilled investigators do this work. Um, all of our investigators are lawyers who are trained in Title IX, 
um, and other civil rights laws, and who are also trained in conducting trauma-informed investigations um, that are thorough, fair, transparent, and impartial. Um, and we have very deliberately put in place policies that provide for robust due process protections um, in our investigations and in our hearings, uh, because this promotes fairness and also helps us ensure that we're gathering all of the relevant evidence. And when the evidence shows that sexual harassment or retaliation occurred, uh, we take disciplinary action that's proportionate to the offense. Um, when the conduct committed is serious, we separate that individual from the university. Sadly, we know that most individuals who experience sexual harassment don't report it for a variety of reasons. Um, I think it's fair to say that many don't report because they simply perceive the, ris the risks of reporting as high and the potential rewards low. Uh, and we need to change this calculus. Over the past months, we've all seen how sexual harassment can occur again and again, and yet still remain hidden. Uh, sometimes as a sort of open secret that's well known to those close to the problem, uh, but not addressed, and maybe not even identified as sexual harassment. So at the university, when we hear persistent rumors or receive anonymous reports of sexual harassment, uh, we take them seriously and investigate them to the extent we can. And we also work hard to lower the barriers to formal reporting of sexual harassment where we can. Uh, we encourage reporting by making our reporting options visible and our response processes transparent. Uh, the last thing we want is for a person who's experienced sexual harassment to become exhausted or demoralized because they can't find the right place to report or understand what will happen when they do. Uh, we also encourage reporting by providing a prompt and humane response process. Uh, these investigations are stressful and difficult for both parties, uh, no matter how sensitively we conduct them. And we know that this can deter reporting. Uh, so we encourage both parties to use advocates, uh, provided by the university who can assist them through the investigative process and afterwards. Um, we provide the parties with status updates on our investigation progress. Um, we provide both parties with accommodations um, to their housing, to their employment, to their academics um, when they need them. And we also take great care to respect both parties' privacy to the extent that we can. Um, so these things that I've talked about are all things we've put a lot of thought into over the past several years, and as a result that I think we do very well at the university right now. Um, and our, our hard work on these matters over the past several years has been paying off, as we've seen our sexual misconduct reports rise rapidly. Uh, and this is one of the counterintuitive things about sexual misconduct work. Uh, when we do it right, the reports go up. And not because more sexual misconduct is occurring, but because we've succeeded in providing clear information about reporting options uh, and in gaining our community's trust about our response process. However, at the university, we know we need to continue doing better, um, that there's always areas where we can improve. Um, so I'll spend my last few minutes talking about a persistent challenge that we, along with our peer institutions, are facing and that we need to do better on. Um, and that is the challenge of prevention. Uh, because we need to stop this problem upstream before it harms our community members and campus culture. And we're now addressing this challenge of prevention with a really innovative and, and comprehensive approach. And on this, our, our president, Eric Kaler, deserves significant credit. Um, because he hasn't shied away from this problem because it is difficult and overwhelming, um, which it is. Um, instead, he's redoubled our university's efforts um, by in implementing a long-term initiative. Uh, that aims to prevent sexual misconduct through lasting culture change. And our initiative is based on the most current research um, in public health prevention. It involves a public health campaign, sexual misconduct prevention education for every member of our community that goes beyond just learning about policies um, and includes bystander intervention skill building, um, audits of our policies and procedures, and really critically, because I think this part is often left out, a rigorous assessment and evaluation of our efforts. Uh, because we need to know what works best so we can keep doing it, and what, what doesn't work so we can stop doing it. Um, through the initiative, we hope to create a new expectation on our campus that every single one of us needs to have the knowledge to recognize sexual misconduct and sexual harassment when it occurs, and the skill and courage to intervene to stop it. Because what the research shows is that intervention by bystanders works to prevent sexual misconduct. Uh, we know that the type of culture change that we hope to achieve doesn't happen quickly. It will take many years to bear fruit. And it doesn't happen through scattershot programming, 
Um, it requires planning and collaboration and a developmental approach, especially with our students, to ensure that each piece builds upon the others. Um, it also requires university leaders who are committed to the effort and actively involved in the effort. Um, and right now the university has these things in place, so this is a really promising time for sexual misconduct prevention at the university. Um, the combination of a, our evidence-based public health approach, um, together with the comprehensive scale of our, our recently initiated prevention initiative, um, is really rare in higher education today. Um, so my hope and belief is that the prevention work we're doing now um, will bear fruit for us and eventually serve as a model for other institutions. Thank you very much. Questions from members? I actually just have one question. Um, I'm intrigued a little bit about the similarity between the university, uh, particularly university athletes versus legislators who can be a little higher profile than the average member of the public. And you talked a little bit about privacy, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, that we're looking at. We want to make sure that the rights of both the accuser and the accused are um, you know, addressed in the proper way, but also that they have privacy through the process until the investigation and whatnot. So I'm wondering if you want to comment on that at all, particularly as it relates to athletes and and your experience with what has come out in the press versus where you're at in the process, and if you have any words of wisdom for us on that, as I, I view us as somewhat similar in being slightly higher profile than perhaps some employees in a company. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That's a really good question, and as I was thinking about this presentation, I thought if you asked me what the biggest challenge is, <laughs> this, this would be it. Um, because we're struggling with this as well, um, because there really is a value to preserving the privacy of the parties um, in these matters. You know, there's, there's great costs um, to um, the health of the, both parties that go through these investigations, um, to reputations, to their future careers. Um, so we need to keep these matters private. Um, we also know that when, when they um, become not private, either because they just, by word of mouth, information passes within the university or because, or when it goes public in the media, um, that that not only hurts those parties, um, but it also deters future reports. Um, because when people see that these cases go public, they say, I don't want to see, you know, my story in the, in the newspaper, and so I think I'm not going to report. Um, so we take a lot of steps to try to... Um, reduce the chance that a case will go public. Um, after we do an investigation, we provide both parties with a really thorough and comprehensive written findings report, um, because we think that's really important from a due process perspective, that both parties get to see all the information that was gathered and um, you know, a complete analysis so, so they can see what our finding was based on. Um, and we want to provide that to them so that they can have an opportunity to fully review it, to share it with their advisor or attorney if they need to. Um, but once we provide that report, um, sometimes it can go public. Um, we've taken some steps to try to reduce that possibility. Um, for example, we now um, watermark the names of the person who we're giving the report to across the report. Um, so if they you know, post it online, it will have their name on it, so it will be identifiable that they posted it. We think that's worked a little bit. Um, but um, that, that, that is a concern. Um, we also have balanced the same concern between transparency and privacy within the university, even when something doesn't go public into the newspapers. So for example, if we have an investigation of sexual harassment within an academic department, um, say a, a graduate student makes a report about a faculty member. Um, even though we as the investigating body don't share, informa you know, share as little information as we can in order to investigate, often word of mouth, um, you know, people start talking about it and people within the department know, it, know that an investigation is going on. Um, and under the Data Privacy Act that we're subject to, um, there's not much that we can legally say um, about what's happening. And that is a real challenge for departments, because when you've had potentially sexually harassing behavior that's remained hidden for a long time, um, and there's an investigation ongoing, it can create a lot of mistrust if we're not, as a university, able to talk about it and what we're doing about it. Um, so we are um, looking for ways to be able to communicate um, appropriately while we're doing an investigation based on the situation, um, balancing both the need to um, promote trust in our process, that we are we're investigating and we're taking this seriously and we'll take res appropriate responsive action, 
um, but also balancing that privacy interest that, um, you know, for the privacy of the parties and for the integrity of our process, um, we, can't, we can't share information. from members. Representative O'Driscoll. Madam Chair, just a uh, quick follow-up. Your, um, your comment gave me pause, I think, when you said that um, the athletes and members of the legislature, although two different organizations, are high profile. It got me to thinking about the fact that um, something that um, Ms. Marsham said, and I'd just like to follow up with her on, on that. Um, you had said that you have a, um, and this wasn't the words you used, but you have a, 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 and again, this is my words, legion of people within the university that are trained to investigate this. My question to you is this, can you give us some kind of an idea, rough numbers, big picture, um, with the University of Minnesota, how prevalent complaints are? Um, does this group investigate employee to employee, supervisor to employee, student to student, student to vendor, vendor to employee? How big is the scope on, on the, um, the, again, my term, legion of people that you've got that, that are available to help with that investigation process. Ms. Marisam? Yeah, thanks. So we have um, five investigators who um, respond to concerns of employment discrimination. So any concern that an employee is engaging or a vendor or anyone else who's working on our campus is engaging in um, discrimination based on you know, race, gender, age, disability, other protected characteristics, including sexual harassment. Um, and those five investigators also respond to all of the concerns that students have engaged in sexual misconduct, sexual assault, stalking, relationship violence, and sexual harassment. Um, so the last fiscal year, our office received about 370 reports total. Um, most of those, 170 of those, were sexual misconduct um, reports involving students. Um, we, in terms of sexual misconduct involving employees, we, given the size of our employee population, we don't get too many of those. Um, the last fiscal year, we had 37 reports of sexual harassment and other forms of sexual misconduct by employees. Um, so that's a pretty small number, given um, the visibility of our reporting process and the number of employees we have. Um, you know, I always have the concern that there is conduct going on that we don't learn about or doesn't come to the Title IX office. Um, you know, once we learn about a potential sexual misconduct issue, the issue is addressed, it's investigated, there's consequences, um, but I know that it doesn't always get to our office. So as part of our prevention initiative, we are, um, we have, we're looking for gaps in our data. And one of the gaps that we found is we don't have a lot of surveying of employees, anonymous surveying, to understand exactly how much sexual harassment is being experienced by employees that we don't learn about because it doesn't get reported. Um, and we're doing that right now to try to, to try to fill in that gap as part of our prevention initiative. Representative O'Driscoll. Madam Chair, just another quick follow-up, and I realize that we do have a robust agenda, but I do think that the University of Minnesota provides a kind of a unique example, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, the 170 cases that you indicated, I'm assuming that, that that's not just the main campus, that's all U of M campuses that are under the, the umbrella of the University of Minnesota, would that be correct? Is um, that is just, oh, Madam Chair, uh, that is just the Twin Cities campus. Um, the other campuses, I, their numbers aren't incorporated in there. Um, I should clarify that of those 170 reports, um, a number of those reporters didn't want to go through it, didn't want to share information or go through an investigative process. Um, we did 48 investigations out of that 170. Um, for the remainder of those 170 reports, we provided um, those who had experienced potential sexual misconduct with resources, um, confidential support, accommodations, et cetera. Senator O'Driscoll? I'm sure I thought I was going to finish with my comment, but the way that the testifier answered the question, I have to ask the question because I'm sure others are thinking about it. How do the satellite campuses then deal with it if there are five people who are in the main campus that are dealing with 170? Any statistics on the, uh, the uh, satellite campuses and how those um, issues are reported and resolved? Uh, Representative O'Driscoll, as a graduate of the main branch in Duluth, I resent your remarks. I'll let uh, <laughs> Ms. Marisom answer the question, however. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative. Um, so in Duluth, which is a larger campus, they have their own 
um, staff who handle student sexual misconduct investigations and employment discrimination investigations. Um, at Rochester, Crookston, and Morris, given their smaller size, um, either the Twin Cities office um, helps on those investigations or they have also um, developed relationships with local law firms who can come in and do those investigations when needed since they have such a smaller number of them. I'm sure my comment is this, um, why I think that, that the University of Minnesota is kind of a unique situation um, when, you, when you compare it to the legislature is in the state constitution, both the legislature and the University of Minnesota are carved out with separate um, constitutional duties, so it does separate them and take them out of any other political subdivision within the state of Minnesota or employer. employer. So I just thought I would, um, would share that observation as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members? Thank you so much. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, next, we have Laura Kushner from the League of Minnesota Cities. If you could just come forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today representing the League of Minnesota Cities. I am Laura Kushner. I'm the HR Director for the League. Uh, from what I've seen and heard, you've already had a lot of great testimony, and you're probably becoming very big experts on this topic yourself, so I'm gonna try and go rather quickly and just stick to some things that uh, maybe are observations that you haven't seen or heard and some action steps that you might wanna consider. I've sent a link to our webpage to Megan Rice, um, and so she will provide that to you if, if you would like it, because I will refer to a couple of resources on our webpage that you might wanna take a look at. Um, the first thing you've heard a lot about is workplace culture, and I think if you take care of this one, the rest of it's probably going to take care of itself. So I think it is something to stress. I think leaders in any organization are the cool kids from high school. I think everybody follows what they do, and I think it's important to uh, pay attention to that. Um, if you think about how to change a workplace culture, um, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I think the lesson from the Obama staffers, the women who did not feel like their ideas were being acknowledged or heard, is a great example of one way to change workplace culture. They engaged in a te technique called amplification where they supported each other and uh, pointed out any time a woman's ideas were not being listened to or heard. So you might want to Google that one time. It's uh, pretty interesting. Um, some other possible action steps, um, you'll see on our webpage that we have a video that we produced with um, some top city officials and leaders. It's called, um, It's on All of Us, and each of the leaders are talking about why sexual harassment prevention and a respectful workplace is important to them. So I think that helps set a tone if you can produce something like that. Uh, we also have a model resolution that our cities can pass stating that they want to provide a respectful workplace in their city. I think those set a good example uh, for cities and, and maybe it's something you would want to consider. Um, requiring and encouraging your leaders to take part in training and to participate it and, and to actively participate it, I think sends a strong message to your organization. Maybe even small discussion groups where they talk openly about the topic of sexual harassment, uh, much like some organizations are doing with race equity right now. Some policies and practices, action steps you might consider. Um, thinking about, I've heard about this, a one-stop shop for your employees, a web page that's dig where everything is congregated, all the resources that you have, um, your policies, your practices, reporting forms, videos, resolutions, anything that you want to put on that web page so that it's really easy for your employees to find it. Um, I've heard a lot about multiple avenues for reporting, and I think everybody can say that's hugely important. It shouldn't just be you have to go to your supervisor or you have to go to HR to report sexual harassment. I think having multiple avenues, maybe an anonymous tip line, I'm a little leery on that one because I am an HR director, and I know that when you get something anonymously, it can be really hard to investigate it, and then um, you're left wondering what to do. So. I'm a little leery on that one, but it's something to consider. I've begun to see policies bro um, published in brochures. For example, the National League of Cities just had their conference in DC a few weeks ago, and they published their entire sexual harassment policy at the front of their brochure, and they said explicitly what would happen to anybody who uh, didn't follow their policy, that, that they would be asked to leave the conference. I thought that was very powerful. Um, some other action steps you might want to consider, um, you know, implementing prompt, effective investigation. I think you've probably heard a lot about that. 
Emphasizing the importance of no retaliation against somebody who complains, I think, is huge. Um, retaliation can be very subtle. It can be changing a work shift. It can be becoming more demanding about somebody's work, more picky about typos, things like that. All of those things can be retaliation. Um, even not inviting somebody to lunch that you used to go to lunch with could be considered retaliation in some circumstances. And then finally, one that's really easy to forget about is following up with the complainants a few weeks or a few months later to find out if they've suffered from any retaliation and how things are going. I think that's a really easy one to forget about. Um, quickly, what you should cover with training. I think you've heard a lot of testimony on that, so I'm not going to go into a lot of depth, but um, making sure that you cover the role of people in power. What is their role in the investigation process? What does the process look like? How long will it take? Uh, what kinds of outcomes will be shared? Um, I saw an article written by a librarian, which I thought was really interesting because librarians have, um, are kind of captive audiences in the library. It's really hard for them to escape when uh, somebody comes in and harasses them. And she wrote an article and she had exact words to use for other librarians when they're being harassed. Um, and I think as adults, we don't like to practice things out loud. We got out of that habit when we left grade school but boy, is it helpful. If I can say the words, uh, what you just said to me was inappropriate and I didn't like it and I would like you to stop. If you can practice saying that out loud, it goes a long way towards um, making sure you can say it when and if the time comes. And then examples of what is and is not harassment. Uh, sometimes people are engaging in bullying behavior or just rudeness. Those are not okay things, but they may or may not meet the defini definition of legal harassment. Lastly, other ideas you might want to consider, implicit bias training um, with a gender focus, how the op opposite sex might view remarks or actions. I think that's important information for us to consider as, um, as co-workers. And I have heard a little bit about something that might be an emerging trend, which is men or women only discussion groups. Um, I've only heard about this from one trainer, and he's um, working with church groups and just working with men to really try and get things out in the open about feelings on harassment and what it looks like. Um, I don't know if that's an emerging trend or not, but I thought it was a little bit interesting. Again, normalizing the discussion around sexual harassment, the way people are doing with race equity seems to me like it has a lot of merit. Uh, somebody else I think mentioned annual surveying of the organization. I will point out that the National Women's Law Center has a free online model questionnaire that you can use to um, survey your employees from time to time. It's very short, wouldn't take anybody very long to do, but I think it's really good. And then possibly requiring leaders to report annually on their anti-harassment activities. And then I will just close with a quote. Um, I asked some of our employees, how do you know, how, what makes you sure that the league will support you if you ever uh, report a harassment complaint? And I thought one person came up with a really great response. She said, I saw it. I saw management take immediate action on a complaint. I saw my manager stand up for his employees. And so I think that is, at the end of the day, what's really important. What your employees see is what is important to them and what they're going to pay attention to. So I think that was a helpful quote. And I'll just uh, close there and try to stick to my time frame and see if you have any questions. Thanks so much. Are there any questions from members? All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, Keisha Mays from United Health Group. If you could come forward. Thank you. My name is Makisha Mays. I go by Keisha. I am an associate general counsel at United Health Group. And um, first, starting off, I just want to say that, as you can imagine, United Health Group has several employment attorneys, and so most of the views that I will be sharing today are my own, um, and unfortunately I will not be able to comment on statistics as they relate to United Health Group. So um, a lot has been said today about policies, and um, I second a lot of what was said, so I won't restate that. But one of the things that I want to talk about um, and this is kind of my own philosophy as I've generally represented um, management. 
And so before, before going to United Health Group, I was at a private law firm, um, one of the larger boutique employment law firms here in town. And, um, you know, thinking about the Me Too movement and um, Time's Up, I think in my mind, and this, there, I'm not the only one, there are other people talking about this and pushing this. I think about what is going to help turn the ship. Um, to me, it's Titanic. And we need to figure out something that's going to help change behavior and culture. Because I think sexual harassment stems from disrespect. It's about um, individuals not respecting one another. And so to me, I think one of the best solutions that I've heard is fostering a respectful workplace. So I'm going to talk. I do have some comments about policy specifically and specifically the um, House of Representatives policy. I did have an opportunity to look at that. Um, but I think I'll spend the most of my time talking about what I would coin the respectful workplace. So, um, because I do think that is really the solution to try to help fix the issue and prevent it. Um, a respectful workplace recognizes and embraces differences. It promotes equity, encourages employees to speak up, it encourages open dialogue, and its foundation rests upon concepts of fairness and civility. So why focus on a respectful workplace? Again, I think there is a need for behavioral and cultural change. And I don't think that telling someone, although you should do it, the legal definition of sexual harassment is going to stop a sexual harasser. It would not have stopped Harvey Weinstein. It would not have stopped Matt Lauer. And as one article put it, we can't fire ourselves out of the problem. So there are reasons to focus on a respectful workplace. There's obvious reasons, the avoidance of negative press or litigation avoidance. But in my mind, it's the right thing to do. And it will go a long way to prevent the type of situation we find ourselves in today. And I think respect is important because it necessarily creates the limits and the boundaries within which we address, treat, and handle others. Put simply, sexual harassment is disrespectful behavior. And nine times out of 10, one does not engage in the disrespectful activity and, di and behavior that is classified as sexual harassment if and when he or she respects the individual with whom they are interacting. So how do you create a respectful workplace? I do think that it's having policies. And everyone, I think that's sexual harassment 101. You need to have a policy. Um, but I do think you have to think about what, what is the purpose of that policy and what are the cultural values that support that policy. So creating a respectful workplace starts with leadership. It starts at the top. Leadership must promote a respectful work environment. Members and employees must observe this type of environment, that it's valued and that it's encouraged from the top down. And the organ organization's value should speak to this. I do think leadership must have the courage and the resolve to say flat out that certain behavior is disrespectful and it will not be tolerated, even if it does not meet the level of sexual harassment. Because as someone said before, if you let bullying and other disrespectful behavior go unchecked, it creates an environment where people think that these types of things are OK. I do think you need to be proactive. It's OK and advisable to periodically take the temperature of your employees, to have surveys, to talk about workplace culture. Um, I was reading a Law, 60, a Law 360 article this morning, and it talked about how law firms, who I think, unfortunately, can sometimes be behind the ball, even though we advise people all the time on how to engage in this area. Um, but it talked about having coffee talks or office hours, um, so to speak, to encourage people to come forth and talk about the workplace. Um, because like um, the previous speaker said, not all, there are a lot of um, instances and cases of sexual assault and harassment that go unreported. So I think we need to get over the fear that if we look, we might find something. Um, and then hoping that nothing bad is happening behind the scenes. That does not cut it. Um, if you are promoting a respectful workplace, you have a duty to inquire and be proactive. And as someone was, once told me, bad situations do not get better with age. So we need to flat out ask men, and particularly women, how can the workplace be made better for you? 
And then I think, um, and this is something that companies do, compile data and figure out if there are trends. Uh, figure out how many sexual harassment complaints did we get from this, are there specific actors? And then when you get that information, you figure out what you, how you're going to act on it. Um, I talked about this a little bit, encouraging employees to speak up, but not just when there's an issue. If you encourage open dialogue, then you are creating an environment where employees feel comfortable with speaking up, not just when there is an issue, but kind of in general. So you keep a temperature on your workplace. Many companies encourage employees to speak up about other violations all the time. You know, if you see something, say something. And I think sexual harassment is one of those things that we don't tend to do that, but we could certainly do the same in that regard. And then there also should be, and this is part of the policy, it's your complaint process. There has to be appropriate and proportional, or a proportional response to complaints and concerns. I think there is a lot of fear that um, companies or organizations may be leaning toward a zero tolerance. I don't think that that's the answer um, because we operate in shades of gray when you're talking about sexual harassment. Not everything is a fireable offense. But I do think that all people have to be held accountable from the highest levels of leadership to the lowest grade level employee. Again, not every offense warrants termination, but some do. And you have to have the resolve and the courage to be able to terminate those employees if the time comes. Um, and then again, we have to be comfortable operating in the gray. There is, this is very complicated work. There's no sub silver bullet. Um, but it's necessary work, and so you do need the appropriate people, trained investigators. Um, the speaker who I uh, spoke earlier talked about um, having individuals who can assess credibility. That is a big thing when you are thinking about sexual harassment complaints because you get a lot of he said, she said. So, you know, and what do you do if one party says this happened and the other says it doesn't, and you don't really have any other witnesses to come forth. You need to be able to have people who are addressing those during the investigation that are able to assess credibility because it can't always be, you know, we got 10 cases, he said, she said, and all of them were no merit. You have to kind of figure out how to deal in that gray area. And then every employee, I'm going to beat a dead horse here, at every level must be held accountable. If not, the workplace will not change. Um, if employees see that leadership takes the, this seriously, and that leadership is held accountable. If a leader is found to have violated the policy and he or she is disciplined and employees see that, it makes them feel like something will be done and that change can happen. Um, and then I can talk about training just for a small uh, period of time because there has been a lot said. I do agree that um, training outside of sexual harassment and training just on respect in the workplace is key. Sensitivity training, uh, implicit bias training, because it helps us to figure out how to learn how to treat each other. Not everybody is comfortable with certain things. And my mom used to have a saying that says, so a man thinketh, so is he. Meaning, just because you're okay with something, you, you tend to believe that somebody else would be. But that's not always the case. And since we work with uh, many different people who come from many different walks of lives, we need to be able to figure out how to actually interact with people in the workplace in a respectful way. And then finally, I did take some time to look at the policy, uh, the Minnesota House of Representatives policy against discrimination and harassment, and I just had a few recommendations. Um, I, I, it's a great policy, and I think the one thing that um, struck me is there, all the, the right things are in there, but I would recommend turning your introductive statement into a definitive statement. It is the policy of the Minnesota House of Representatives to promote a respectful workplace that is free from discrimination and harassment and go on from there. Um, there is a portion of the policy that states nothing in this policy shall be construed to guarantee members and employees greater protection than the protection provided under federal and state laws. I would consider if this message, if this is the message you want to send, I would recommend that state and federal law is the floor and the House of Representatives can and should hold its members to a higher standard, especially if its purpose is to prevent sexual harassment in the first place. There are several places in the policy that focus on the fact that sexual harassment is unwanted behavior, highlighted and bolded, underlined. Consider what message you're sending 
by continuously calling out this specific part of the definition, unwanted. What is being said to or perceived by victims? Does it encourage reporting? I would recommend not highlighting these specific words. Give them the same weight as every other word in the definition. There is a portion about supervisors reporting, and I would just recommend if supervisors are required to report, and I agree with what Stephen said in terms of managers being required to report, there's a little bit more static in terms of coworkers reporting, um, but to make clear their reporting obligations. What is considered promptly reporting something? What if an individual tells the supervisor he or she does not want the situation to be reported? Again, I second Stephen, if a manager gets a, um, a report or a complaint, they should be sending it up or investigating it. And then under your complaint procedures, I would consider including language that a bystander may also make a report if he or she believes someone has been harassed. Finally, under um, other options, there's a statement that says, in addition to or instead of utilizing the House of Representatives complaint procedure, the employee may file a complaint with the EEOC or MDHR, Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Um, yes, that is true, although I would suggest removing instead of, be, and you can leave in in addition, and I say that because an, as an employer, you always have an obligation to investigate reports, and employees should be encouraged and feel comfortable bringing them to you first. Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions from members? Representative Portman. Thank you. I appreciated your comment that the law should be a floor. And I appreciate I might be putting you in a difficult position as a defense attorney to ask you this question. Um, but you, you referenced the Me Too movements and the Time's Up movement. How, how different do you think the standard is in the law than what we're socially seeing come forward and be expressed by young women in particular today? Ms. Mays? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think it is different. I think um, what we are seeing, and I experienced this even with going, you know, just kind of going over my remarks with certain people, that what we see in the media is that a man or a woman, it's gotten to the point where you wouldn't even be able to walk up to somebody and say, you're beautiful, or, you know, something as you know, kind of simple as that that there is going to be a sudden, like, you can't say anything to me about my appearance. It is not, you know, within your purview. So I think that's what we see in media right now. Although it was, if you recall, it started with Harvey Weinstein, and so it was way bigger than that. But I think what we see now has gotten to the point where there is a perception that women in particular don't want you to say or call out anything about their sexuality or their appearance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the law is not there, and, and I don't think it should be, personally. Um, and you, the piece that I try to explain to the group of individuals is that the unwanted does make, that make sense. Because if someone comes to you and they say, well, you're beautiful, it's not that it's a free pass, but in the law, that's not going, that's not going to be a claim. That's probably not even going to be a violation of the policy, especially the first time. Because at that point, no one knew it was unwanted. Now, if the person says, you know, thank you, I appreciate it, but I don't feel comfortable and I don't want you making those kind of comments, and then the, the person is crazy enough to go forward, then you have a problem in the policy. In the law, probably not yet, as uh, Stephen mentioned. And so there is a big disconnect, um, but I think the, the thing about that is employers are in the middle because we make policies where, and I will speak specifically, specifically to UHG, where our policy, you're going to be in trouble way before there would be a violation of the law, because that's the type of workplace that we want. Thanks so much. Any other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank um, you. Next on the list is Emma Denny from the Hallinan Law Firm, if you'd come forward. the members of the subcommittee um, for asking me to speak today on this very important issue of harassment in the workplace. Um, my background is that I'm a private attorney representing um, employees only. So I'm the one suing companies when things have gone wrong. 
Um, and so <clears throat> my experience has been seeing a lot of toxic workplaces and seeing where and why the harassment occurs. And so my comments today are going to be focused on kind of some of the things that I've seen of what not to do. <laughs> um, Brittany, could you just state your name again for the yes, record? Yes, it's Emma Denny, um, and I work at Howland in Law. Um, so there's really only one way to end harassment in the workplace, and that's to make sure that people are em encouraged and empowered to come forward and report it when it happens. Um, and I suggest today that there's four main mechanisms to encourage people to come forward and report it. Um, the first is the ease of reporting. <clears throat> I know that the, the House's policies deal with you know, formal reporting procedures and that sort of thing. I would like to suggest that there is no wrong way to report, and that needs to be communicated to, to all. You know, some people might opt, you know, you opt to utilize a hotline that is set up for them, or you know, if there's a formal online portal to submit a written complaint. And those avenues should be available to people to use. But that doesn't mean that the person who reports verbally to their supervisor isn't making a report and that that shouldn't be handled promptly and appropriately. I've had cases, I had a case where one of my clients reported to her supervisor, you know, verbally that she was being sexually harassed by a coworker 17 times over six months. And he did not do anything. He did not elevate the complaint. He did not take any steps to address the harassment whatsoever. It was only when she finally submitted a written report a, you know, quote unquote, formal complaint that steps were then taken. You know, and his response later on when that, because that's the kind of behavior that leads to a lawsuit, that's the kind of behavior that leads to a problem. Um, so later on when we were in the lawsuit, his excuse was, well, you know, it wasn't a formal complaint, so I, I didn't think I had to do anything. So training should address that mentality and should say, you know, yes, we encourage you to utilize these formal processes, but um, as a manager, as a supervisor, if you get an informal complaint, you're, you need to be the one to elevate it or, or point them in the direction of how to, to go through this more formal process. Um, <clears throat> so again, just to emphasize in the policies, there's no wrong way to report harassment. Um, I, I've also seen a case where somebody was actually punished for reporting quote, the sexual harassment in the quote unquote wrong way that didn't follow the policy and was actually punished for that. Um, so again, that's the kind of behavior where you're going to be getting a lawsuit on your hands for that. Um, and that's, so that's not what we want. Well, maybe what I want, but not, probably not what the members of this committee want. Um, so that's the first way to encourage people to come forward, is um, ease of reporting and making sure they understand there's no wrong way to report. Um, the second is fair investigation procedures, which I know we've talked a lot about today, but I just want to emphasize, you know, how important it is to have an independent body. I think, you know, at the House of Representatives, there's ample opportunity to have an independent committee or whatever it may be. Um, it doesn't have to be lawyers. It could be lawyers, um, you know, House employees or some sort of outside body. Um, but it needs to be an independent agency because... Our nature as humans is to get defensive. When we or people we work with um, are accused of doing something wrong, you know, at, we, we automatically think, well, gosh, I didn't do anything wrong, or you know, my friend who's my coworker didn't do anything wrong. So the people who sort of have a vested interest in the situation should not be the ones investigating it. Um, so there should be trained individuals and trained independent neutral individuals who are conducting any kind of investigation process into complaints of harassment. Um, that's very important. Um, so when they investigate, they need to be speaking with the person who's reported harassment, but not in a way that makes them feel interrogated or like they're on trial. You know, just it, what happened? What was the problem? How did that make you feel? What would you like to see happen? Is there anyone else I should talk to about this who has seen similar behavior or who might have more information about this? Um, you know, also speak to, obviously, the person who's being accused of harassment and get their side of the story. But the goal is not here is not to immediately jump in and try to discredit the person who has um, reported harassment. Because, again, when it gets to the point of a lawsuit, that's what I've seen happen a lot. The employers do an investigation that is completely biased and aimed at discrediting the person who's reported the harassment. That's going to deter people from reporting, um, and that's going to ensure that harassment continues in the workplace. <clears throat> The third thing that needs to happen um, 
in, to, in order to encourage people to come forward and report harassment and ultimately end it is that once there's been an investigation, once there's been a complaint, the employer needs to take adequate and appropriate steps to end the, aimed at ending the harassment. Now, a lot of people think, okay, that the main aim of this whole process should be to punish the harasser. That's absolutely not the case. The main aim of this is to end harassment and make sure that people feel safe and secure in their workplace. Um, so what does prompt and you know, adequate steps look like? I wish I could give you a one-size-fits-all answer on that, but unfortunately it's going to really depend on a case-by-case -case situation. I would encourage the House to adopt policies where once an investigation, once that report has been made, some action is taken during the pendency of the investigation. You know, perhaps separate the, the people, ensure that the harassment's not going to continue while the investigation is ongoing. In other words, you don't have to wait until something's been quote unquote proven um, to take action to end harassment. You know, people can't wait months and months still being harassed by the same person while they're awaiting on the outcome of an investigation. Um, so that those steps need to be taken before. Um, after the investigation is concluded, um, you know, again, the seriousness level of the offense is going to dictate the seriousness level of the punishment. Um, and, but the main goal, again, is not to punish the harasser, I wouldn't say, although sometimes, of course, it rises to that level and that needs to be done. The main goal is to end the harassment, um, whatever that looks like. Um, you know, whether that's providing more training, separating the two individuals so they no longer have to work together, um, things of that nature. <clears throat> So the fourth step towards ensuring that people feel encouraged um, and you know, empowered to come forward, and I think this is actually the most important one, is that strong anti-retaliation policies and a culture of preventing retaliation are absolutely critical. Um, in the trainings that are done, it, it needs to be just important and right up there with sex harassment training and policies, no retaliation whatsoever for people who report whether or not their report is ever quote unquote substantiated. Um, if somebody reports something, managers, supervisors, everyone needs to know that person should not be retaliated against in any way, you know, whether that's, yeah, cutting them out, ostracizing them from groups of coworkers, you know, um, little things up, you know, and then up to and including big things like firing them because they've reported harassment. Um, people aren't going to come forward if they fear for their jobs or fear for the continued viability of working somewhere. You know, if somewhere is a miserable place to work because you've now reported harassment, um, then people aren't going to come forward and report it. Um, so I think that managers, supervisors um, need to be trained on not retaliating against employees and making that, violating that retaliation policy also a punishable offense um, just as much as violating the sex harassment policy itself. Um, so to wrap up, those are kind of the four specific pop, like, main ideas that I think are important in making sure that people feel empowered to come forward and report harassment and to end harassment. Um, first, ease of reporting. Second, fair investigation procedures. Third, taking prompt and adequate steps that aren't just aimed at punishment but are actually aimed at ending the harassment. Um, and then so fourth, making sure that there are strong and enforced anti-retaliation policies in place and in action. Uh, Thank so you. that concludes my remarks. Do members have any questions? I have a question with regard to retaliation. What sorts of retaliation do you customarily see when it happens? Typically, um, and when it gets to us, it's come to the level of usually termination. All of a sudden, somebody who's been a strong performer in the workplace, they report something such as sexual harassment or other illegal behavior in the workplace, and then all, you know, maybe, maybe involving their supervisor. Um, and then all of a sudden, the supervisor starts to find fault in their work performance very quickly and suddenly. There's a drastic turnaround. Um, and then very shortly after they've reported this harassment, um, they're fired under, you know, for job performance or some other kind of flimsy reason. That's the most typical type of retaliation that I see. Just to follow up, do Oops you Portman. see situations where an employer um, tells other employees not to associate with the individual who's made the complaint? Yes, I have seen that. And again, I would say that's a form of retaliation. I had a client who had to go to work in virtual silence because none of her coworkers would even talk to her after she made a report of harassment. And that was, you know, that campaign was being led by the alleged harasser, but the supervisors 
um, and managers certainly were complicit in it and at least abrogated their responsibility to step in and ensure that wasn't occurring. Any other questions, members? Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming today. Next on the list is Kelly Janetta from the Kelly Janetta Law Firm. If you'd come forward. Thank you. I'm Kelly Janetta. I'm a uh, solo practitioner in the North Loop of Minneapolis. I'm an employment side attorney. Um, I'm currently also the chair this year of the Minnesota State Bar Association Labor and Employment Section. And I'm past president of uh, the Minnesota chapter of NELA, which is the National Employment Lawyers Association. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I know that you've heard from a number of individuals, and I second most of what everybody has said so far. And I apologize if what I have to say is um, going to be repetitive or somewhat repetitive in any event. Um, where Ms. Mays ended with taking a look at the House policies, um, that's where I'm going to start today. Um, in preparation <clears throat> for my remarks today, I took a look at the Minnesota House of Representatives policy against discrimination and harassment. And I, too, was struck by the repetitive use of the word unwelcome, where policies describe prohibited behaviors. Um, for example, on page five of the policy, the reader is told that sexual conduct or communication may constitute sexual harassment or sexually offensive behavior if it is unwelcome. And unwelcome is stressed. Similarly, on page six, the policy reiterates that sexual comments and comments about one's body or sexual activity uh, is prohibited if unwelcome. I believe that these policies would be more powerful if the behaviors proscribed in the policies were not limited by the legal construct. As you've heard today already, under our current state of the law, it is only unwelcome conduct or communication that if the other pieces of the legal construct fall into place can constitute a legally cognizable sexual harassment or hostile work environment. The House should set a higher standard. If the goal is to create a safe and respectful working environment, the House should prohibit, without limitation, members and staff from making sexual comments, from talking about one's body, from talking about sexual activity, from telling sexual jokes or stories, or from discussing their sexual practices, etc. Another piece of the sexual harassment legal construct is that conduct or communication must be severe or pervasive. Unfortunately, in interpreting whether conduct is severe or pervasive, sufficiently severe or pervasive, our courts have set an unreasonably high standard. Conduct that most people would consider offensive, egregious, and having no place in a respectful work environment do not make the cut under law. A case where a supervisor squeezes a plaintiff's breast, a case where the supervisor rubbed the plaintiff's back and shoulders and called her baby doll and said that she should be in bed with him, a case where the supervisor asked the male plaintiff to watch porn with him, these are all examples where the court chalked up the behavior to um, the, uh, the perpetrator being boorish or to just not being severe or pervasive enough to rise to the level of sexual harassment. Again, the House can and should do better. In its policies, harassment is defined as repeated disparaging, repeated belittling, repeated demeaning, repeated insulting names or remarks, repeated jokes. Behavior shouldn't have to be repeated over and over again to be prohibited. The House should aspire to a higher standard. I have had clients who were groped, who were drugged and then raped, whose supervisor talked about their body parts, who mimicked masturbating in their presence, who talked about their sex lives, who asked about my client's sex lives, who had porn on their computer screens. Women are reluctant to complain each time their supervisor or coworker or somebody else within the control of the organization looks them up and down or comments on their body or caresses their shoulder or talks about their sex lives. They don't complain because they don't think complaining will make a difference. 
Sometimes the behaviors happen right out in the open. Sometimes the behaviors occur in front of people in positions of power, in front of leadership, in front of man management. Women see um, that leaders don't intervene, that leaders don't take action, and they don't complain because they don't think that anything will be done. They also don't complain because they're afraid. And as Ms. Denny um, uh, addressed, women are afraid of being retaliated against. Um, in addition to being terminated, um, I've had clients who were demoted, who were denied plum assignments, who were denied um, the opportunity to um, um, participate with her colleagues. I had one client who um, was not allowed to sit in the same um, uh, cubicle area as her team members after she complained about harassment. She was relegated to a, an area away from her team. I had one client who, what, whose office was moved to um, a basement office without windows after she complained about um, the behaviors. Um, I had one client who had all of her work taken away. Um, she uh, was somebody who took great pride in the work that she did and um, um, really enjoyed going to work every day until she complained about harassment and then had all of her work taken away. And she sat in this windowless office with nothing to do for a very long time. The Me Too and Time's Up movements have brought public awareness to the prevalence of sexually harassing behavior in the workplace. Knowing that there are other women who have experienced sexual harassment will hopefully make women in, in all workplaces less afraid to come forward. As more women speak up, more women are empowered. And as more women speak, the less often a woman will be inclined to normalize inappropriate behavior. And I think that's part of what is going on as well, or has been going on for a long time. Women, um, many women, not all of course, and it's not always women, um, but, but more often than not it is. Um, um, so some women have a tendency to normalize behavior because it's just so prevalent um, that uh, um, um, they just don't think it's something that they should even bring to anybody's attention, that they don't think it's something that they can or even should do anything about. Having, cl having clear policies that proscribe sexual harassment and a clear reporting structure uh, are a start, but it's not enough. Regular and repeated training is not enough. Most employers do have policies and they do provide training, but harassment keeps occurring. The reality is that people don't need a policy to say that it is prohibited to grab a woman's butt or to talk to her about her sex life or to talk about his sex life. It, a policy is not going to stop that behavior. Sexual harassment in the workplace will only be eliminated once we recognize the root of sexual harassment and we embrace a systemic change in workplace culture. So what is the root? Um, I think the, the, the biggest problem is the imbalance of power, or at least the perception of the imbalance of power between men and women. When a woman's reporting structure is largely made up of men, when they see men get the good assignments, the promotions, the kudos, the credit, they feel powerless. When men are the dominant gender in positions of leadership, they feel empowered. When women are talked over, interrupted, belittled, condescended to, leered at, made fun of, subjected to gender, demeaning gender-based language, they learn that speaking out is only going to hurt them. When men see that other men are permitted to behave with impunity, they are emboldened. So how do we get there? Keisha Mays um, talked, um, and Laura Kushner talked um, about implicit bias training. Um, that, I think, is something that the House should seriously consider doing in addition to the other training. In a March 17, 2018 New York Times article, Heather Murphy wrote about a study um, that will be published in an upcoming, upcoming issue of the Academy of Management Journal. Um, in that study, even when a man and a woman read the same exact words off a script, only the man's leadership potential was recognized. Um, the, uh, 
I don't know if you saw this article in the New York Times or not, but um, the article was uh, um, called Draw a Leader, What Does She Look Like? Trick Question. Um, in this particular study, um, participants were, um, were asked to, um, in, a, in a sales meeting, um, to draw a picture of what they think a leader looks like. Well, guess what? They drew a man. Um, across the board, leaders drew men. Um, they also um, had um, Eric's and Erica's um, speak on a number of, of topics in this particular industry. And um, uh, when the Eric's spoke up with change-oriented ideas, and I'm kind of reading and paraphrasing here from the article, they were far more likely to be identified as leaders than Eric's who simply critiqued their team's performance. But Erica's did not receive a boost in status from sharing ideas, even though they were exactly the same as the Eric's. Um, and the study just goes on. And it's, I mean, the bottom line is um, men are perceived to be leaders in many cases, in many industries. Women are not, even when women use the same words. Um, when we process information through a biased lens, we interpret data and judge situations consistency, consistent rather with those biases. This will only change when we consciously examine our internal biases. And we, are, we will only begin to put a dent in sexual harassment once women, more women have a seat at the table. As Keisha Mays also said, and I apologize for being repetitive, any change, um, any and all change, or any and all effort, I should say, needs to be top down. Individuals in positions of power need to walk the walk and they need to talk the talk. They need to exemplify the high standards that you should expect all of your house members and staff. They need to speak out when they see abuse. The house needs to have or shore up a code of conduct. There should be regular and mandatory in-person training for everybody that involves role play and reenactments and the training should be repeated several times a year. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, questions? I actually thought of a, a question. You said something that triggered a question that I have. Um, so currently, I don't have the list in front of me, but I think for, for us, the mandatory reporters from a legislative perspective are the speaker, the majority leader, the minority leader, and the two personnel chairs. Um, I think those are the five, and we can check in a second. But currently, that would be four women and one male. Okay. Um, which is pretty cool, um, that but cool. that may not always be the case. It could be easily the case where it were five male mandatory reporters, and I just wonder if you want to comment if, um, let me look, I do have the list here. Uh, I think, oh, there's one more additional male legislator on the list. But anyways, the point is that if, they were only, if there were only males in those positions, and I hope that's not the case going forward, but if they, there were only males, is that uh, problematic from a reporting standpoint? And if that were to happen, do we need to address that in some case so that there's at least a, one female or two female mandatory reporters from the legislative perspective? We have several on the staff perspective, but that is not where another legislator would yeah. report. I don't think it's a problem if um, the majority of mandatory reporters are male. It depends on the male. Um, as so long as you've got training, you do implicit bias training, you do sexual harassment training, um, it's, it, it's, it's not whether you're a man or a woman, it's, it's whether you get and understand that sexual harassment in the workplace, and not just sexual harassment, not just that which rises to the level of sexual harassment under the law, but um, behaviors that um, are simply disrespectful, like um, what Keisha Mays was talking about, um, as long as you have people in, in positions um, that, that understand that and get that, um, then, um, then you're fine. Does that answer your question? Yes, Does, thank okay. you. Um, any other questions from members? Okay, great. Thank All you right. so much for your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity. Now we're going to move on to Minnesota Management and Budget, and they're going to testify on the January 2018 report titled Sexual Harassment Prevention Policy and Procedures Report. So if you could just identify yourself for the tape before you begin. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Emily Leffoltz. I'm the Director of Policy Research and Planning at Minnesota Management and Budget. 
And Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Kristen Anderson. I'm General Counsel and Enterprise Employment Law Counsel at Minnesota Management and Budget with about 20 years of employment law defense side experience. And to start off, um, Madam Chair, um, there are, should be two handouts in your packets, the actual report released in January by the executive branch, and um, for the public, a handout that summarizes the report. The report's available online. It's essentially a boiled down version of the executive summary, but it includes all 10 recommendations that we put forward. Um, and uh, the uh, MMB, Commissioner Franz, wants to make clear that however we can be helpful to the efforts of the legislature, um, MMB wants to, to do so. Um, and the governor has also um, reiterated those <coughs> remarks. Um, I personally worked at the House, and your HR department I've had only the best experiences with. They've been fabulous. So I know this is a very complex issue, and it's a lot bigger than just an HR department. And to the extent that our state employees, a 33,000-plus workforce, um, interact with the legislature, there's hundreds if not thousands of state employees that work with the legislature. This is something we'd really like to partner on, if at all possible. Um, Governor Dayton requested this report last November, and we released it in January, so it was a very quick turnaround, but we tried to do our best in creating what he, what Governor Dayton wanted, which was an accountable and critical report that was transparent in the problems that the state faced and um, with recommendations in moving forward. Um, and again, there's 10 recommendations in the report that you can review. We're only going to touch on kind of the ones that we thought were the most important due to the um, time constraints today. Um, and this is only for cabinet level agencies, so uh, it, it was limited to a little over 33,000 employees under that umbrella. The process of drafting the report included, um, just to, as a reminder, Minnesota Management and Budget contains the HR support services of the state workforce. And so there's a lot of experts in these areas, including Kristen, that work on these issues. I was just sort of someone that helped pull it all together. But those experts met with a variety of people around the state. Um, Commissioner Franz convened a group of commissioner, a, a panel of commissioners, including DHS, Revenue, DOC, National Guard, D, DPS, and of course, Commissioner Franz, MMB. Um, in addition to this, MMB staff met with stakeholders from across state government, um, including employee resource groups, which I know was mentioned by the League. Um, in a sense, they are, the League of Minnesota Cities, um, it's like a discussion group of employees. And we went to these meetings and tried to get a better sense of what different groups of employees were thinking about sexual harassment, what they'd like to see. We also met with affirmative action officers, um, councils such as the, Asian, the Council of Asian Pacific Minnesotans, Minnesota Council on Latino, all the ethnic councils, all the councils on um, disability, um, to understand um, better how a person's background, culture, religion, gender identity, disability, all these um, factors influence how they respond to sexual harassment, how they might report or be hesitant to report sexual harassment, what different issues they might face. Um, we also met with uh, Commissioner Lindsay at the Department of Human Rights, um, as well as labor union leaders. Um, there's a lot of distinct um, challenges with the diversity of this large workforce that the state faces when it comes to kind of boiling down um, best practice moving forward. So we tried to do our due diligence. Um, Finally, we reference quite often, and Kristen will touch on it, the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, report from 2016. As just a reminder, the EEOC is a federal agency that administers and enforces civil rights laws against workplace discrimination. And they did this fabulous report in 2016 that we really followed their best practices um, in reviewing our policies. This was released in January, our report. And um, there'll be, there is, um, it is part of the governor's supplemental budget to pay for some of the larger recommendations in it. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to explain those rec a few of those recommendations. Madam Chair, members, I just wanted to cover a couple of the recommendations and some of the findings that, uh, that we came up with in, in our report. As Emily pointed out, one of our uh, major source documents was the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's um, study on sexual harassment in the workplace. And, and two of the, the things that really came out from that report is number one, what you've heard over and over to, again today, is policy, having a strong policy, and the second is training. So we did examine our uh, statewide policy and found that we do in fact have a very strong statewide policy with a very strong prohibition of sexual harassment and retaliation. 
We adopted this policy and actually revamped it um, in 2016 as a statewide policy with a directive to state agencies to adopt the policy. But what we found in our, in our study was that, in fact, a lot of the agencies had not yet adopted the policy. So one of our biggest recommendations is that the state agencies all adopt the statewide policy as their framework policy, and then if they have agency-specific items that they can add those in as an addendum. So one of the things that I think is very, very strong about our statewide policy is the definition of sexual harassment. And what we've heard a little bit before today, many, many policies um, define sexual harassment for their policy pers perspectives exactly as the law defines sexual harassment. So unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, but that's severe or pervasive and also interferes with the terms and conditions of an employee's employment. Some of our agencies had policies that tracked that sort of standard, and in fact, we wound up in a particular case in arbitration, having the arbitrator reverse discipline for uh, a sexual harassment situation because the arbitrator determined that we didn't prove that the, the victim's employment uh, was interfered with because of the behavior that was clearly bad behavior. So what we decided to do in the statewide policy is simply define sexual harassment as unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature. It does not have to be severe or egregious. It doesn't have to interfere with the terms and conditions of the victim's employment. And this, again, coincides with the EEOC's best practice recommendations that we set the level of a policy violation at a different point than the law so that we can stamp out bad behavior before we wind up with an actionable claim. So that is a, a real strong feature of our statewide policy. Our policy also uh, governs conduct wherever employees provide public services. So not just in the agency um, grounds or in the agency buildings, but really wherever our employees provide public services. If it's tax auditors out doing an audit, our policy uh, applies there. Our policy also applies to third parties with whom our employees interact. It prohibits our employees from harassing third parties and also tells our employees that we will protect them from harassment by third parties. We do have improvements that we are looking at um, uh, for our statewide policy, including beefing up the bystander uh, recommendations. Right now, we do not have it as a mandatory reporting for colleagues to report harassment that's, uh, that's going on amongst coworkers, but we want to empower those folks to be able to understand how to intervene effectively on behalf of their coworkers. But in our policy, we do require all supervisors to report sexual harassment up the chain of command. We have that same reporting expectation for all leaders, for human resources, and for affirmative action officers. Another shout out I want uh, to make is that we do have affirmative action officers in every state agency, a cabinet, cabinet level agency, who are really experts in this area. And um, although a lot of employees sometimes look at human resources departments as being on the side of the employer, our affirmative action officers are really there as in-house enforcers of these employment law protections. And oftentimes employees feel very, uh, very welcome to report harassment situations to affirmative action officers and know that they have, um, have a very strong voice in those affirmative action officers. We also have instituted an online policy review for our statewide policy. Uh, by the end of February, we had over 32,000 state employees who have reviewed our statewide sexual harassment policy and have acknowledged that they uh, have read it and understand the prohibitions against sexual harassment and retaliation and understand the multiple avenues of reporting sexual harassment situations in the, in the executive branch. Finally, I wanted to touch on training and what we're doing uh, in the executive branch on training. Uh, for many, many years, it has been part of our uh, probationary period for supervisors that they have to go through what's called supervisory core. And that uh, program has always included a sexual harassment prevention training. Um, but that's something that supervisors only get during their probationary period, and it's not repeated. Many state agencies have uh, training programs both, both for their employees and for their supervisors. But what we realized through this uh, report investigation is that we need to beef up our training from an enterprise level to make sure that all of the executive branch workforce are hearing a, a consistent message. So we have developed our own 
um, training that's very specific to managers and supervisors, looking at what managers and supervisors' special duties are in this area. And we've heard some testimony before about the fact that managers and supervisors, when they have knowledge of situations going on, that that knowledge is imputed to the state. And so we have uh, really robust training now for our managers and supervisors, about a two-hour training course um, for managers and supervisors um, so that they understand their special responsibilities to maintain a respectful workplace. That training, uh, as you know, we've got a huge workforce and the best practice recommendation is for that training to be face-to-face. -face. So what we've uh, done is created this train the trainer program where we have at this point by Friday, we will have trained 150 um, state agency, human resources, affirmative action officers and trainers to go out to their agencies and deliver this face-to-face -face training to their managers and supervisors. We're also developing that same sort of coursework for um, all employees so that all employees get, again, that same consistent statewide training, although many agencies are doing training uh, independently as well. And finally, what we've heard uh, again from other testifiers is that investigation processes are very, very important. We at MMB, again, we have um, many, many investigators out in the state agencies. We have done investigation training in, in the past, but we're um, revamping that training and making that training more robust to make sure that our in-house agency investigators have expertise on how to investigate in this area. We also do have outside investigators on contract whenever we have situations that require um, outside investigation if, if it's a high level uh, individual who's involved in the allegations of harassment then we have that available but we want to make sure that our in-house investigators are well trained um, in how to how to address these circumstances thank you and I'm just members oh, sorry. madam chair oh. There's just a couple more things in our testimony I'm just going to touch on. Oh, I'm sorry. No, sorry, but we kind of tag-teamed a little bit here, and there's three more recommendations that I want to briefly touch on. Again, there's ten total, so there are others in the, in the report that if you'd like to read through. But one of the most important ones is the creation of an independent office for the investigations that Kristen mentioned. Um, again, right now, some agencies have robust investigation teams. Some don't have any, and they have to contract out. Uh, this would create a central office that um, all that would investigate all forms of harassment and discrimination, not just sexual harassment, um, and would also take reporting. So if you weren't comfortable reporting to your supervisor or within your agency at you know the Rush City Prison or something like that, you could come to, you could call and connect with the central office who have trained staff on hand. Um, and this would also help a little bit in the consistency of how we handle these complaints, because that's that's been kind of a concern. It's been a concern of the governors, uh, certainly. A second one is a communications plan to have something in place that constantly communicates to help the culture around se sexual harassment, to um, uh, emphasize the training and reporting options and reinforce that training. And part of that, and something we heard from a lot of employees and something that the EEOC recommends, is a survey, an all-employee survey. Um, it's really difficult to measure the extent of the problem of sexual harassment in a workplace because reporting is very inconsistent. Some places don't have very high reporting numbers, and that can be a bad or a good thing. Often it's a bad thing because they don't feel comfortable reporting, and vice versa. And so a survey can help um, gauge whether or not people understand the sexual harassment policy, whether they have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. So surveys are a really important part of that communications plan. And finally, senior level accountability. It's something that's been difficult to kind of nail down what that means exactly besides training. And, um, and that's a lot of a communications plan to have the senior level management included in providing that communication, uh, putting this as part of performance reviews so that if you, uh, that, that it raises it up among senior level management and also reporting to the governor is a part of the report on um, agency sexual harassment policies and reporting. So with that, happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions from members? Uh, Representative Freiberg. Thank you. Just a quick question. Um, you mentioned that this, these suggestions are limited to cabinet level agencies, which is about 33,000 employees. I'm just curious how many state employees are not covered by it. I assume legislative branch and judicial branch employees aren't. I'm just wondering, ballpark figure, how many, else there, how many other ones there are. Ms. Anderson. So, uh, Madam Chair, members. 
Um, first, what I want to make uh, clear, our report and the review that we did was limited to cabinet level agencies because of the short time frame that we had to produce the report, but our recommendations would be applicable to all executive branch cabinet level agencies, boards, commissions. Um, there, I think all total, there are about a hundred and some um, when you look at all of the agencies and boards and commissions that comprise about 35,000 employees. I have just a follow-up question for, I think, Ms. Leffold. You mentioned that this new independent office uh, would look at not just sexual harassment, but all harassment. What about other employee conduct? Would it just limit to harassment, or would, would, would there be other um, conduct that it would look at as well, and what might that include? Madam Chair, that's a great question. Yeah, all forms of harassment, discrimination, um, and it's been it's been talked about. Again, this office isn't formed yet. We'd need funding, um, but uh, fraud is another one that we've talked about. So, if you wanted to report some um, fraud that you've observed, um, that would be another place to report it. Again, having this independent from um, agencies themselves, and those would you, those agencies would retain. I mean, if you feel more comfortable reporting to your commissioner or you know, in whatever agency you're in, you can certainly still do that. But if you don't, there'd be this separate place to come to, and all investigations would be um, through the independent office. Um, so, correct, there, there are other um, types of claims that this office would investigate. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for coming today. Um, that's all we have today. Thanks for the sitting here for, for two hours. I think we get some great feedback today. So um, next week is our break, and we will be compiling all the information, and then we don't have a meet the next meeting scheduled, but we will keep you posted and obviously notify you when we have um, the next steps pointed out. Any other questions? Seeing none, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>